This is the State of Things. I'm Frank Stacio. We might think of silence as the absence of sound, but is silence only def- defined in terms of sound, or does it have its own characteristics and qualities? And what is the lack of silence in modern times doing to our physical and our mental health? Filmmakers Patrick Shen and Brandon Vetter set out to examine those questions. The result is a documentary, In Pursuit of Silence, which screens at Full Frame Theater in Durham on Friday. Patrick Shen and Brandon Vetter join me now on the program. Welcome to both of you. Hello. Thanks for having us. Patrick, what made you decide to make a film about silence? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I was introduced to silence uh, very early on as a child. My parents were very non-religious and never had conversations with me about uh, these sort of existential concerns I started to kind of grapple with as as I grew older and I became obsessed with uh, Native American spirituality as a teenager and began attending these Native American powwows and uh, just kind of continued building upon this kind of blank slate that my parents handed me uh, upon which uh, I began to explore, you know, kind of where I fit in the world. And as I began making films, all the themes I found myself tackling fell in line very much with this sort of existential sort of journey that I was on. And Silence, in a way, was kind of a, a culmination of all of that. My first film was about mortality, my, and I made another film about wisdom. And uh, and so this is kind of, a, like I said, a, a culmination of sorts. Um, it wasn't until about 10 years ago that the, the, the seed to make a film about it, or ex- at least explore the topic a little bit further, uh, was planted uh, when I saw a film called Integrate Silence, which is a, a film about um, monastics that live in the French Alps. And that's when I really kind of began to think about silence um, as a thing in itself and something more than just this acoustic sonic property, the absence of silence, as you said at the top of the segment. Well, tell us more about that, the the inherent and essential qualities of silence that are not defined as over and against noise or sound. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways of of talking about silence. Um, and that was one of the, the major challenges that we faced in making a film about it. It's such a slippery subject. Are we talking about, you know, the silence between speech or the silence um, between musical notes? Or is it a sonic property? Or is it this um, this this doorway through through which we might have a religious experience or, or seek a higher power? Um, and, uh, and and the, the other challenge, I think, was, was also that silence is this type of material that perhaps shouldn't be explained. Um, you know, when you set out to make a film or documentary, especially, you, you set out on a process of demystification, right? You're trying to explain something to an audience. And we knew that, that we were risking possibly stripping away all the interesting stuff from the topic of silence if we set out to kind of just spell it all out for people, if if there's even such a thing, um, or if, if, if it's even possible to do that. Well, you talked with a writer in this film uh, who influenced you, George Prochnik, who wrote a book called In Pursuit of Silence. I want to listen to a clip. The etymological roots of the word for silence are, are somewhat contested. There are two words in particular that people go back to. There's a Gothic term, anasilan, and then desinere. One of them has to do with the wind dying down, and the other has to do with a kind of stopping of motion. They're both to do with an interruption, not just of sound, but the roots of silence are also due to do with the interruption of our own, the imposition of our own egos on the world. So that's writer George Prochnik. He's in the film In Pursuit of Silence that screens Friday at Full Frame Theater in Durham and then later this month at Cary Theater. And I'm talking with the film's creators, Brandon Vetter and Patrick Shen. So, Patrick, that takes us into the, the, the maybe the spiritual and psychological realm, realm. I mean, that takes us out of physics and into a kind of silence that has to do with, uh, you know, the chatter in our head that constructs an ego. Talk about how that plays a part in your film. Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, the religion, you know, the monastics, I should say, are really the, the, the pioneers, I guess you could say, of, of this work of, of silence. Um, and I think the conversation really kind of began, began there. Um, all religions have in common some aspect of sort of quieting this chatter, as you put it. 
um, you know, in, in Buddhism, you have talk of um, the beginner's mind. Catholics talk about the ground of being. And I think it's Hinduism that talks of uh, pure consciousness, this idea of sort of eliminating all the chatter that, that blankets our day-to-day experience, that distracts us from what's actually happening in the lives we're actually living um, and gets us back to a more pure experience of the world around us. Um, and in a way, we, we tried to sort of um, pay tribute to, to that experience in the film by interweaving, delicately interweaving, I should say, the, the, this an experience of silence and not just talking about it. We talked early on in, in the process of putting the film to, to, together uh, that we wanted to make a film that was equally of silence um, uh, and about silence. Well, Brandon Vetter, therein lies the challenge. How do you sort of mediate um, this unmediated thing called called silence? How do you convey the idea of a thing that asks you to put your ideas aside for a moment and listen to something deeper? Uh, what's the challenge of making a movie about something that you want people to sort of not do, which is watch a movie? <laughs> Yeah, that's something that we talked about a lot from the very beginning um is just how to how to create this experience um and make the film as experiential as possible and you know with the feature film format we we have 80 minutes to um you know kind of build in this experience into you know people's the the you know learning and um there are times where you actually get to experience silence within the film. And we took uh, a lot of care in mixing the film and recording the film uh, in really interesting ways on location to make sure that we had all the tools once we got into the mixing suite to to make that experience really um, a very rich experience. And, you know, with the visual component of it, that was something that kind of we just we talked about as much as possible as we were shooting it and what we came from you know was of the film that we made previously was uh, a film that was largely set in Haiti and was very kind of uh, sweaty and loud and lots of movement and lots of kinetic energy and we kind of had to take a much different approach with this film where you know John Cage plays a big part in the film and we follow his journey from from noise and this kind of in, in, incredibly, you know, uh, layered noise compositions to his his finding of silence, and we focus on his performance of four thirty three. And when we when we started to study that, we realized that there's he gives so much space for the audience to become personally connected with that with that silence and with themselves and in, you know, trying to take what we learned there into the visual side of things, we wanted to give the audience a a big palette, you know, of, of shots that are interesting enough that you can stick with for a while. Um, but you can get bored in and you can get reengaged with, and you can kind of move around in these shots and, uh, this visual material and, and make it yours by the end of it. Well, you talked about John Cage, and you feature him in the film talking about his art and the way silence figures into it. Let's listen. The function of art is not to communicate one's personal ideas or feelings, but rather to imitate nature in her manner of operation. Cage's most important piece of music is, as many people know, actually not music at all is four and a half minutes of silence. When Cage first performed that piece uh, with David Tudor as his pianist, he performed it in Woodstock, New York, at a little barn called Maverick Concert House, and the audience went berserk. This is 1952, August 29th, 1952. They were incensed. They were in an uproar over the performance. And afterwards, uh, John opened the, the floor to two questions. And, and uh, uh, one of the artists got up and said, good people of Woodstock, I think we should run these people out of town. That was the reaction. <laughs> and that was David Tudor, a collaborator with John Cage, talking about a performance of a silent piece in the film Pursuit of Silence. It screens Friday at Full Frame Theater in Durham 
and later this month in Cary. And I'm talking with the film's creators, Brandon Vetter and Patrick Shen. Um, I mean, that is the challenge, too, I guess, in a, in a film like this, uh, that that you sort of have to have a cool-down period in some ways. Everybody's coming from this very noisy place, you know, and they <laughs> sit down in the theater. Um, you talked about In the Great Silence, which is this uh, kind of traces a year in the life of a monastery. We hear sound in that, and there's movement, but it, it, it's all so gentle that you, you eventually sort of become part of the silence, but you have to sort of work your way into it. And it's harder and harder these days, isn't it, to calm down and to, to kind of get quiet, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, we're, we're immersed and bombarded with, with sound and, and noise constantly, and it's gotten to the point where we can't really escape it. Um, and and the moments of silence are 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 becoming more rare as our society sort of um becomes more and more advanced and industrialized and it's become a real problem i think a lot of people are just starting to haphazardly create these machines and industries that are pumping noise into our our environments and creating this sort of sonic dumping ground of sorts um and you know you find even in in working spaces which you would expect to be somewhat quiet um and conducive to kind of um you know focused and intentional kind of work um that even the air conditioning vents are much louder than speaking volumes and so you're not only constantly fighting other voices and and noises from fax machines and phones and and whatnot but it's even the the ventilation in the building is is preventing us from a true engagement with the work that we're doing and a true engagement with the world around us and the other people around us. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy to filter that out. We're not aware of that, but the brain is saying, okay, if it's ubiquitous and if it's constant, I don't need to worry about it. It's obviously not a lion. That's in one place and it only happens once. So I can relax. But that takes energy to filter out and screen out that sound. Yeah, that's right. I mean, as they say, there's our, our we don't have um, ear lids, you yeah. know. So even if we're consciously um, sort of tuning it out, it's still entering our our systems, and our bodies are having to respond to it. And sure, you know, all the the research that they've been doing over the last fifty years supports all this 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 uh, information, the, all this data that that um, uh, that says noise pollution is is harming our systems, um, even when people. Uh, report that they have slept through the noise event. Um, it's the, all the studies are showing that their bodies are responding just as they were, just as they would have if they were awake. You talk so their the heart rates are heart rates spiking. are going up. They're spiking and they're not going back down. And the response rate is yeah. is not uh, not very quick. You, you just can't stay in that state for long without health effects. Mm-hmm. You talk to Dr. Wolfgang Babich of the German Federation, uh, Federal Environmental Agency, and here's what he said about the health effects. People don't die from one day to another because they visit a noisy area. If the noise stress becomes chronic, if it's persistent over many years, all of a sudden you may have a heart attack due to the chronic stress. Dr. Wolfgang Babich in in the film Pursuit of Silence that screens Friday at Full Frame Theater in Durham and later this month at the Cary Theater. And I'm talking with the film's creators, Brandon Vetter and Patrick Shen. Um, health effects are important, and also the cognitive effects of noise. I mean, they, they have an effect on us mentally as well and, and, and emotionally, don't they, these noises? Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, we talked a second ago about the cognitive overload that's happening. Um, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, it's happening, and we're, we're, we're using all this energy in order to, to fight it um, and to, to sort of stay honed in on what it is, the, the, the task at hand, you know. Um, you know, restaurants are uh, probably a, a great example, um, a very well-known example of this situation where you go to a place where you expect to sit down across from someone else and and engage with this person, but you find it nearly impossible to hear them, let alone engage with them and and find the energy in your own system to, to mm-hmm. actually, uh, m- you know, meditate on this moment and, and the situation and um, emotionally connect with this person. Well, and you talked about, too, we talked about the way silence can be reflected visually in, in the way motion plays out. And um, I like that you talked with Susan Cain about this, an author who also related it to solitude. Let's listen. Historically, solitude has always had an exalted place in our culture, and it's really only recently that it has fallen from grace and now needs to be restored to its rightful place. 
You look at all the religious traditions, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad, uh, and Moses. Like, these were all seekers who would go off into the woods, think their thoughts, uh, have their revelations, and then come back and share those revelations with the wider world. We lose a lot when we don't allow people, and not just allow, but encourage people to go off by themselves, you know, whether literally into the woods or metaphorically, to just go and chart your own journey and do it by yourself. And there are certain paths in this life that you've got to walk alone, and that's the only way to do them. Author Susan Kane in the film Pursuit of Silence that screens Friday at the Full Frame Theater in Durham and in Ke- at the Cary Theater later in the month. The film's creators are Brandon Vetter and Patrick Shen. So has it changed you? I'll start with you, Brandon. Uh, I mean, obviously you've had some thoughts about the importance of silence going into this film. Coming out of it, have you changed your behavior? Have you found yourself looking and making more time for silence and solitude? Yeah, you know, it's it's... It's one of those things that you can't really turn off once you turn on, um, you know, just being sensitive to, to what's going on around us in terms of our our sonic environment. It's it kind of, you know, it can really drive you crazy <laughs> if you spend too much time thinking about it. But, you know, I, I think that it's really it's had us us all on the crew really kind of reflective of how to wrap our, our lives more around the idea of solitude and silence um, and j- exposed really just how, how loud of lives that we live. Um, one of the things that I learned about in the film that I've kind of taken into my, my practice is um, this, this therapy called float therapy. Um, and we just see it real briefly in the film, but it's... Um, you know, a a chamber, kind of like a sensory deprivation chamber that you float in salinated water and um, it's completely silent. And, you know, I've realized that it kind of takes that level of shutting the world off for me to to begin to quiet the chatter of... um, of my life. It's great stuff, and I appreciate both of you coming on the program and talking about it. Brandon Vetter and Patrick Shen, filmmakers behind Pursuit of Silence. Thank you both for being on the program. Thank Thanks you. so much. In Pursuit of Silence screens Friday at Full Frame Theater in Durham later this month at Cary Theater, part of the Full Frame Road Show. We have details at our website, stateofthings.org, produced by Laura Lee, Anita Rao, Will Michaels, and Charlie Sheldon Ormond. Robin Copley is our technical director, Brent Wolf, WUNC's news director. North Carolina Public Radio is a broadcast service of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm Frank Stacia.